Hello, I'm Andrea Darup, Professor of Pathology at Duke University School of Medicine, where I am the course director for our Medical School Pathology course. I am also a co-editor of Robbins Essential Pathology and of the upcoming edition of Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. The title of today's talk is Key Concepts, Outcomes of Acute Inflammation. Now, inflammation is something that you'll be learning about early in your medical school career because it is such a basic concept and because it affects everybody. Every single patient you will be treating will have to be considered in the context of acute inflammation, whether because of trauma, infection, surgery, myocardial infarction. How we as physicians treat acute inflammation and deal with the outcomes of acute inflammation is critical for excellent patient care. Now, the impact of acute inflammation is going to be very closely seen in the vasculature, and we'll cover that in another video. I want to begin by just showing you what the vasculature uh, looks like in health. So here we have an arterial, cap, uh, capillary bed, and the venule. Right? The reason I'm showing you this is because I'm going to show you some images of what we see in acute inflammation, and I think it's nice to have a baseline. So here is, by comparison, what we will see in acute inflammation here on the right. We're going to see uh, dilation of the small blood vessels. So if you compare uh, this arteriole to this one, you can see it's markedly larger, as well as over here. We can see the capillary bed is expanded, and we have edema with extravasation of neutrophils. So this image, if you can just remember this image, it will give you that little snapshot of what happens in acute inflammation. Now let's work through the process. So acute inflammation is really characterized by three processes, dilation of the small blood vessels, increased permeability, and emigration of leukocytes. So how does this occur? So say you have some sort of injury, you have an infarction, you have a bacterial infection, toxins, or trauma, this is going to activate the immune system, and the immune cells, like macrophages, are going to begin uh, eliciting mediators. These mediators are going to have an immediate effect, primarily on the vasculature, causing vasodilation, which we've already demonstrated, and increased vascular permeability. This is what's going to lead to this edema and what's going to help these neutrophils to extravasate so they can get to the area of injury, either an area of necrosis, as in a myocardial infarction, so they can eat up the dead cells, or where there may be some microbes for them to attack. All right. So this is the big picture. If you can keep this in mind, you have an overview right here of acute inflammation. Now, let's look at the possible outcomes of acute inflammation. Because you need to have this idea of what happens afterwards to help you understand what is going on in your patient. And we're going to go through each of these individually, but I wanted to show you the big picture first. So one outcome is resolution, where everything returns back to normal function and health, all is good. Another possibility is abscess formation, where you have a great large sea of pus. You can get chronic inflammation if you don't get resolution of your acute inflammation, and you can end up with fibrosis. And these two here, resolution and fibrosis, are really two ends of the spectrum. They're two possibilities, where chronic inflammation and pus formation are intermediate steps to get there. So let's talk about these in detail. So resolution. If the injury is small, if we as physicians uh, address the infection quickly, uh, then we'll have clearance of the injurious stimuli, the dead cells, uh, the mediators will be cleared, we'll get replacement of those injured cells, and normal function. So this is ideally what we would, uh, would hope would happen. So say, for example, uh, you get uh, a knock on the, on the shoulder and you have a bruise. There's going to be extravasation of blood, you're going to have an inflammatory response as the dead uh, erythrocytes are cleared, there will be some neutrophils coming into the area, but it's a minor injury. Everything is going to go back to normal function. There will be no knowledge that you have that you ever had a hematoma there. Now say, for example, something happens which is a more significant injury, and we're not able to clear uh, that injurious stimulus, uh, or there's such a significant injury, uh, for example, in a myocardial infarction, that we end up with such an extent of dead tissue that we can't replace it with the normal cells. In that case, what the body says is, let's put in some fibrosis. Let's slap up some plasterboard. Let's slap up something here to hold everything together. Because you, you can't just have a big, rotten, dead, necrotic area of the heart. We got to put something in there, or 
the individual is going to die. So this is fibrosis. And you will end up, when you have fibrosis, you will have a detriment to your function. You will in some way be impaired. So here's an example, as I mentioned, of a, of a myocardial infarction. So this is an individual who had a significant occlusion of the left anterior uh, descending artery, leading to a large area of necrosis. Now, what will happen initially is you're going to get clearance of the dead tissue by neutrophils, but then our macrophages are going to come in here, and we're going to get a number of mediators, which uh, we'll discuss in our chronic uh, inflammation and in our wound healing uh, video, that are going to replace this necrotic tissue with fibrosis. Okay, And this depends to some extent on where the injury occurs, because some areas like the liver are really good at regenerating themselves, the heart, the brain, not so much. So this is important for you to recognize that where the injury occurs is also going to have an impact on how the injury is resolved. Okay, so I referenced um, pus formation and abscess. So this is going to be something that happens, say for example, you get a small splinter in your finger. Uh, and you leave it in there. You don't, you don't, aren't able to get it out. I hate it when that happens. Um, and you end up with a small area of pus as your immune system is working on dissolving that tiny splinter. And eventually it is, it comes out, maybe you still have a little bit of uh, a scar tissue there. But say you have something much larger, uh, like you get uh, a piece of shrapnel or you have uh, a piece of debris that, is, um, that you get through some sort of injury, right? The body is going to uh, have all these neutrophils coming here. And the normal response for a neutrophil is when it comes in and there's the microbe, it's going to eat the microbe, it's done its job, undergoes apoptosis, it's dead. But if you have continuing stimulus, or you have something so massive, more and more neutrophils will come, right? They are being brought in by uh, all of the receptors they have, the, uh, the path pathogen-associated uh, molecular patterns. They're coming in and forming this big group. Now, once they come in, each one, as it's done its job, is going to die. And once it does that, it's going to create this anoxic, hypoxic area without blood flow, which is just... A real sort of gluey mess. And this is one of the reasons we'll talk about uh, doing an incision and drainage. So if you have an abscess, you'll have this sea of pus. And part of what the body will be doing is to try to wall that off, right? Because the body doesn't want to have all of this coming out tracking through tissues. And so you can't treat someone simply with antibiotics because since the vasculature doesn't really communicate, as you can see nicely in this picture, right? So once more, the image is showing you what you need to know. The, uh, the vessels here are no longer connecting. This is a hypoxic, uh, undervascularized area with a sea of neutrophils. So what is happening here is you have to incise, remove what's in there, and treat. So this is something you'll be doing uh, on your clinical uh, experience. So let's take a look. Here's uh, just a beautiful example of an abscess. Uh, this is actually from acute appendicitis. And there are a couple of things I want to draw your attention to on this. So first of all, you need to be able to recognize these cells. So these multi-lobated little cells here are neutrophils, okay? So if you ever see an image on a, on a step exam, on one of your exams, uh, and you see these multi-lobed little guys, they're neutrophils, it's acute infection, acute inflammation. Now, just as an aside, and this is a more sophisticated uh, pearl for you, often we have mixed inflammation. So right away, we're going to get that acute inflammation. But we're going to have, unless it's cleared immediately, there's going to be chronic inflammation that comes along too. So don't get confused by that. It's not an either or. It's not acute or chronic. Often we have acute and chronic. And what we can see here is, here is that, that abscess I mentioned, the sea of neutrophils. These are in pretty good shape. They're not dying. Uh, or maybe they're, they're just a little bit dying, but they're, they haven't completely died because truth of the matter is, is that's not very photogenic. And I wanted you to get an image for what we see. So what we see here are these are the neutrophils that are on their way, making their way to this, uh, to this abscess. Uh, so this is that classic appearance. So keep that in mind. 
So when you have this, right, if you have a, a, a tiny little abscess, then perhaps it can clear, as I mentioned, with a, with a tiny splinter. But most of the time, if you have an abscess that forms, you're going to move on to fibrosis because this damage, the damage to the blood vessels, the uh, large area that has necrosis in it, is going to be so significant that you are not able to rebuild and go back to resolution. So you're going to move on to fibrosis. Okay, so that covers three quarters of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk briefly about chronic inflammation because chronic inflammation is actually its own video topic, okay? I'm trying to keep this focused on what happens with acute inflammation. So say you're not able to clear this infection, you have an ongoing source, and an example of that would be a viral infection. Uh, or a, con a chronic infection such as tuberculosis. So that's the classic chronic uh, infection. Uh, you can also have persistent injury. Uh, and then finally, autoimmune diseases. Now, if you look at that uh, graphic that I showed you earlier, it does not show a little arrow that goes from chronic inflammation to resolution. Right? Because the thinking is primarily that once you have chronic inflammation, we're going to move over into fibrosis. But you have to remember this about the body. Right, Everything we're talking about is dependent on the extent of the injury and where the injury occurs. Okay, So say, for example, right? so I have autoimmune hepatitis, and I would be very sad if we never got back to resolution. Right, Because my goal is to get back here to normal function with my liver. Okay, uh, And that is, in fact, what's going to happen. I'm on immunosuppressive drugs, which are keeping my immune system from attacking my liver. And once we've done that, the liver, as a, as a regenerative organ, is going to be able to replace the hepatic parenchyma. Now, when I was first diagnosed, 50% of my, my liver was necrotic. Right? So, so that, ordinarily, you think, would be very bad. We'd be going right on to, to, to fibrosis, and, and I wouldn't be doing very well. But the truth of the matter is, is with immunosuppression, even in the case of autoimmune diseases, we're going to get back to resolution. Okay, so I just wanted to, to make that point. I also wanted to take a moment, even though this focuses on acute inflammation, because I like to do compare and contrast, is to show you what you would be seeing in the context of chronic inflammation. So we've already looked at neutrophils, right? And I've already told you, when you see those little multi-lobed guys, you gotta think acute inflammation, right? Here is what you, if you see this, Right? I want you to think for a second, take a look, tell, tell yourself what are these cells, put it in the comment section. Right, These are going to tell you chronic inflammation. These are gorgeous. These are plasma cells. Okay, So here are some plasma cells. This is actually in a case of autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, not my particular case because we caught it before we got quite this bad. But you need to be able to recognize plasma cells. All right. Um, the way that I recognize them here is you have the eccentric nucleus, and the nucleus is off to the side, off to the side, 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 side. And then you have this clear area here, right? So it's got, uh, this is what's called the HOF, or the front porch. Uh, it's because these cells are generating lots of antibodies, and so uh, their uh, protein machinery is really revved up, so they have this cleared area. So they look like little ladybugs. Some people will talk about clock face chromatin. Don't focus on that. Think about little ladybugs with a little cleared area. The other thing that tells you chronic inflammation, and here's another classic case, right? So think, what tissue are we in? This is lung. Right? Hard to tell. I'll give you that. Uh, this is a granuloma. Here are your giant cells. Right? Right here. Beautiful. And this will be covered once more in the video on chronic inflammation. This is uh, tuberculosis. And when you see something like this, it's telling you chronic inflammation, not acute inflammation. So keep that in mind. All right. Back to our story. So when you have chronic inflammation, when you uh, have cleared this as you're moving along, say you've treated appropriately, you're going to move to fibrosis. So this is what you see once uh, tuberculosis is treated. Now the reason I can say that autoimmune hepatitis is different is because, as you know, the liver is very good at regenerating. It's very unusual in that. So there are not a lot of tissues that will regenerate as well as the liver. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about outcomes of inflammation. Okay, so here is the whole picture uh, from, from the uh, 11th edition of Robbins and Cotran, sorry, Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology, right? So here we have our acute inflammation, which we discussed, where the things are still getting revved up in the first one to three days. We have uh, vasodilation, we have edema, we have neutrophils coming out, 
all right? But we're able to clear it. We move to acute. Uh, the acute inflammation is gone. We move to a resolution. Oh, we're not able to. It's too big. We've got too much going on, too much uh, pus forming, right? So we're not able to move over to resolution. We don't see an arrow here, right? Instead, we're going to fibrosis. Once more, keep in mind, if this abscess is teensy, teensy tiny, you could move to resolution. But for the most part, once you've got a large abscess that you have to incise and drain, you're moving down to fibrosis. So one way that you can get to fibrosis is also simply acute inflammation can go directly to fibrosis depending on which uh, organ was affected. So that's what we would see in myocardial infarction. And we can also see here as we go through uh, chronic inflammation, this is another potential. Once more, if you're involved in the liver, chronic inflammation may end up with a happy ending here in resolution. However, it could also end up here in fibrosis. Okay, so here are just a couple of questions. Take a moment, you know, hit pause, see if you can answer them for yourself uh, to see if you've understood what we've just covered. So what are the possible outcomes of acute inflammation? What determines whether acute inflammation results in complete resolution or fibrosis? So you should be able to answer that. If not, go back and watch the video. Please uh, do subscribe. Uh, we're trying to get these videos out to as many people as we can. Uh, and put in the comments below if you have any suggestions for something else you'd like for me to, to cover uh, in one of these videos. And as always, thank you very much and have a great day.